Hello, my name is Vinny Valdez. I'm a senior principal architect with Red Hat Consulting. And today I'd like to share some automation that we've built for specifically deploying OpenShift using Ansible Tower, running on a provider, and then ultimately moving on to install Red Hat Cloud Forms and some additional applications. Now this video will focus on Ansible Tower and the automation of its configuration, but feel free to take this code that's on GitHub and use it for your own purposes. We first gave this lab at Red Hat Summit in 2017, and the provider was Red Hat OpenStack Platform. And we were able to provide each student with their own unique environment using hardware that was provided for each student. But in subsequent labs at other events, we haven't had such a luxury. So we've had to switch to Amazon AWS for those environments. Now this automation that we're looking at is extremely flexible, which allows us to specify the number of students that we want to host. In this case, I'm just going to deploy two for this demo, but we've deployed up to 60 for other environments, and I imagine you can deploy more depending on your budget. So there's different playbooks here. I'm not going to go through each one. I'd like to focus on just deploying the environment and exploring it, but quickly would like to point out that we do have a variable file here, which you can customize, and this will let you set things like the name of the overall lab, the name of each student. Typically, we just leave this as student, but if we're at a unique environment, we could call this you know, a user or whatever is required. And here's our student count. Now we do support student counts. So for example, not starting at one, but maybe we need to redeploy, you know, 10 through 13 or whatever the case may be. We can also do that here. And there's a uh, number of other variables. We can see that we need our access and secret key. Now, obviously we don't want that in Git. So that's why you see a lot of variables here. But we want to specify the tower AMI ID and the, the OpenShift cluster platform AMI ID as well. And then you have to provide details about the environments. So let's just jump right to it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is use Ansible Playbook to call the AWS Lab Launch. So this I didn't go through, but we'll look at it later. This will loop through based on this specified student count and deploy that many tower instances. So I'm gonna call Ansible Playbook. I'm gonna pass my, as an extra variable, I'm gonna call the YAML file that contains my access and secret key as well as some passwords. And then I have another file which customizes some of the variables that I just showed you. So my environment, my AWS VPC, my subnet, my security group, and so forth. Also the name of this environment, of this lab and the student names and all of that is customized already. So let me go ahead and just kick off AWS lab launch. Now, the first thing that's gonna happen is this playbook will use the EC2 module to talk to AWS and then spin up two instances because that's what I specified for the student count variable. And then it will wait for those to come up completely and for SSH to be available. After that, it will SSH in and begin the configuration. Now there's different configuration types available for this automation that we built. You could specify a variable called tower underscore config. You can specify that as none. And what that means is it will simply take that AMI, stand it up, and then exit. So it's not going to configure tower at all. And the purpose of that configuration is to allow your students to go through and manually configure Ansible tower. So we do have in our GitHub repo, we have instructions on how to do that, but we found that it did take quite a few attempts and some students took anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to get the full manual configuration done. Now, while that's a good exercise on its own for a lab that involves so many other products, taking up nearly half the time on just the first part and not even getting to the OpenShift install, which itself can take up to 30 minutes, uh, was really easy up a lot of time. So there's other options available. You can specify tower config as full, which will give you everything configured already in tower. And the student simply logs in and begins the job that will then go off and create the OpenShift environments. That's not something we're doing here either. We're doing something else called tower config self. So what that will do is provide a very minimal configured tower, which will then allow us to let the students come in and execute the job to configure the rest of tower. Now tower is configured already as an AMI very minimally. All we have in there is a license and the AWS secret and access keys. These two tower instances running, we have some tags here. We have the name, we have the lab name, which I've called seminar in this case. The role itself is tower and the user is gonna be demo. So there's a unique student ID. Uh, in this case, this one is demo one. If we switch over to two, Predictably, this is going to be called demo two. And the reason for that is if we have a lot of students, for example, I mentioned 60, you don't want student 59 logging into student 21's system. In fact, they won't even view any other systems. They will only view what's tagged with this specific student ID. And we'll see how that works in a minute. The VMs have come up, they're responding to SSH, and I'm just scrolling up here to show some of the other things that have happened. One of the first things done before we switch over to configuring tower is creating a Route 53 domain 
for each system. We'll see here that we're actually using those domain names for the Ansible host. We need to make sure that those exist and that they're resolvable. Once we tell Amazon to create those, we then install bind utils, and then we run a host command to automatically try and resolve that host every few seconds until it works. So I've seen it happen pretty quickly. I've also seen it take as much as five minutes or so. Uh, now we'll see here that we're iterating through the variables and we've identified that we have been asked to do a self-configure. So those actions will happen now full. There's something else called test, which will go beyond full and actually run the jobs and those are being skipped. And then we move down to installing the package requirements for Tower CLI onto the Tower system itself. Now these have been pre-baked into, uh, into the image itself. Just for speed, we've, we've disabled that uh, in the playbook itself and that's toggleable through a variable. Okay, then we set things like the username and the CLI password, which are used for Tower CLI, but we do the majority of the work through the Tower modules, which are community supported but any features not in there, we would have to use the Tower CLI. Okay, so then we go through, and I'm gonna spin through this pretty quickly because um, it's not a, very interesting to kind of look at the output here, but we can see that uh, we're configuring things like the inventory. Uh, there's things called inventory groups. Uh, then we need to sync the inventory. And the reason I'm doing this now is I wanna to add Tower to its own inventory so it knows about itself. Then we're gonna add a project here, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, but it's essentially the Git repo that I, we were just looking at. So it adds that as a project, it updates it to make sure that it's synced with GitHub, but many of these other tasks are skipped. So I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom. We see that we are done now. Uh, it took a little bit over three minutes, so not too bad at all, and that's for two towers. Obviously, we'll take a lot more time with the increased amount of towers that you have to deploy, depending on how quickly the AWS API responds. But okay, so it's nice and easy to grab one of these, so I'll do that. One of the nice things about creating these unique student IDs is we actually automate the configuration of these as the user itself. So this will further ensure that we don't have students logging into the wrong system, whether it's maliciously or not. Uh, but we see here we have a host, we have an inventory and a project. So let's look very quickly. We have our Git repo, as I mentioned. So I'm gonna go ahead and edit the project just to look at the details. So we have the URL to the Git repo itself and we have our branch. And if I look at inventories, I have one called OpenShift. And you can see this is a dynamic inventory that is set up and we've pulled in our own host name for tower. Now I'm gonna edit this very quickly just to show how we're doing this. We're doing this via an instance filter, which matches the student ID. So if I look at the other tower instance, the demo-2, that would be demo-2 here as well. Lastly, we'll look at templates. We have this self-configure that I mentioned. So if I edit this, we can see that it is a run job it is pointing to the project we just mentioned, which is that GitHub repo that's been synced, and we're gonna execute the tower config playbook. Now this playbook will end up calling a tower config role, uh, but we can look at those details later. Lastly, we have some extra variables here, which were defined in one of those extra parameter YAML files that I included. Let's go ahead and kick this job off. This is self-configure. So what we're looking at here is an actual job running, and you can find that under jobs. It does automatically put you into that job, but if I click here, I can see what is happening. We have this self-configure being run. You may have noticed that the inventory sync just completed, which is a uh, part of configuring the inventory. There is an option there that I have set, which allows it to update the inventory uh, whenever you launch a job that uses that inventory. Okay, back to the job. We know a lot of information here, and this is really a huge advantage of Tower. We can see when it was started. We can look at each one of these, and if you see, I can click on one of these and get some JSON output of that task. If I scroll down here, you can see you can set the verbosity. Okay, so that job is finished. So here's another nice thing. We can see that it's successful, and we can see the elapsed time. How many hosts, how many tasks, and so forth. I do have a callback enabled, which breaks that down further within the playbook itself. So we can see what took the longest and the total time here. So this is extremely handy. So let's now go revisit our projects. And now we see that we have OpenShift Ansible. And you see this type is manual. If I edit this, this is pointing to varlib awx projects into another directory. The OpenShift playbook packages are already installed on Tower and being used for this project. And the reason for that is we can come over to templates and we see a whole lot more than just the self-configure. So I've used naming to kind of sort these. Uh, so zero meaning, that, you know, this was obviously something that should be done ahead of time. And then the next workflow template I want to execute is this uh, deploy OpenShift on AWS. Just talk about some of these other ones. So we've got our workflow templates here. Here's the deploy one provision. And if I do an edit on this, I can see that what it's actually calling is an AWS create host, which is simply a playbook to spin up those servers as needed. A lot of the other information is very similar here. 
And then if I look at deploy two, and I'm not gonna go through every one of these, I just wanted to show a couple here. This one is using the manual local directory. So I have to point to something on the system in that directory. So you can see here, there's many different OpenShift playbooks that I can call, and I'm calling the build your own config. So we're gonna go ahead and kick this off. I will would like to show one more thing down here. There's a scale up provision, install, post install, but then I also have a terminate. A good advantage here is that when I'm done using this cluster, the students themselves can run a terminate all, which will clean up everything in this environment, including tower itself and including all the Route 53 entries and any EBS volumes that were used. Now terminate OCP is only to delete the OpenShift master and node in case something happened during the install and you wanna start over just that portion of it. So let's go ahead and kick this off. Really that concludes our overview of the automation of Tower. I'm going to kick this workflow off now. We'll wrap up this video by taking a look at some of the playbooks, their details, and how some of this automation was accomplished. And this job workflow template is running, but it's calling other job templates. So if you click details here, we can look at the individual playbooks running. There we go. So we're provisioning the instance and we're waiting for it. Very similar to how we created Tower, but this is now able to be executed by the student themselves. And there we go. And this was successful. So we've now completed our provision. We saw that the instances are already on Amazon. Next is to do the OpenShift install, just after we do an inventory sync. So the inventory sync will now pull in those two new servers that have been created, and we should see that reflected in the inventory. And as soon as that's done, it will start the install. Okay, it just finished. So now we should see the two OpenShift. There we go. We have the master and we have the node. So now Tower is fully aware of all of the pieces in this environment, and it can go ahead and run the OpenShift install itself. This deployment is gonna take anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes. But before we're done, I'd like to just take a quick look at what was executed. So if we look at the lab launch itself, so this is, as I mentioned, using the EC2 module to create the instances themselves. Here's where the tagging is done. Now this is hard coded to Tower because we're only deploying Tower. Later on, when this is done for the master and the node, that is dynamic. We have our with sequence here to go through the student count start and end. We have our wait for SSH, and then we're creating a custom host group so that we can manipulate these tower instances, which is what we do here. So we're gonna call that custom host group that we created, and then we're gonna go ahead and register Route 53, install bind, and here's our loop where we're trying to resolve our host name and make sure that it's propagated out. So that's all there is to the lab launch itself. Now at the bottom here, it's gonna include the tower config playbook. So if we look at tower config, this is simply calling the role tower config. Now it, it does need to make sure that tower config variable has been set. So this is where the tower config none, self, or full can come into place. And just quickly to take a look at the tower config role, I have this broken down into all of the different pieces. So if we start with main.yaml, I'm trying to include only the pieces that need to be configured. So a lot of this is available to be toggled on and off via booleans. I mentioned that a lot was done ahead of time. I have that labeled as prereqs. That's where we do things such as installing RPMs and the tower CLI via pip and other pieces that are required. This is also where the RPM for OpenShift playbooks are installed and symlinks created and other things. So just for speed, we have those disabled. Then we set some authentication and I walked through the playbook a little bit. This is essentially the workflow of the playbook itself. And then these themselves are called in subdirectories. So for example, all of the projects are defined here. If we just take a look at one quickly, we can see we're using the tower project module, but then there are other places where we use the CLI itself. So that concludes this demonstration of how to use Ansible Tower and how to automate Ansible Tower. Thank you.